invite ne uh, next for, to a very interesting session with Devi Mani. Devi is the founder of Scoop. And uh, she will give us remarks as an industry insider who is now an outsider. Um, she's a well-known HR figure. She was with Hewlett Packard and HPE, and before that with Target, IBM, and GE in leadership roles. And famously and interestingly, she has now founded a separate for-profit focused on weight loss and is addressing uh, chronic disease, diseases in children. And here to give us some pointers on what we can do best, next is Devi. So like Nalini said, um, my name is Devi and I'm here to talk about uh, what I've seen of health within the corporate and outside of it. Um, I was told I don't need to have PPTs, which I thoroughly enjoy not being a part of corporate. So um, walk with me, if you will, on a story because that's the best that I can tell you right now. So when I uh, started working with well-being or wellness per se, um, I still remember it was being pushed out as, a, as an initiative that most of our US counterpart companies were doing. Uh, it was a nice to do, and when we pitched it to our leadership, it was, uh, the comeback was, listen, don't add anything to my rate card because I can't afford this hit on my margins. Um, and I don't believe, and I, th I think at that point of time, we accorded ourselves the liberty of not looking at um, wellness per se because we had the uh, uh, luxury of cross subsidies, in insurance, we had subsidized rates. Uh, I still recall we used to cross-subsidize our health insurance with asset and fire, which was incredible, right? Because we, we could have really bad claims ratios and still get away with paying peanuts for uh, health insurance. And therefore, we had uh, what we wanted on our balance sheet, which is a very controlled premium number, and had zero understanding of what exactly was driving our claims ratios at that point of time. Fast forward a few years, and the tariff structure changed um, we no longer could cross-subsidize, and uh, health was really getting worse. We also started seeing you know, the stray incidence of um, a 30-year-old or a 40-year-old succumbing to an ailment or an, uh, or an event which shouldn't have happened at all to any person at that age. So that's when you know, we started talking again about wellness. And along with this, uh, we started a whole bunch of other things. We started you know, copy on claims, we started asking employees to raise their own uh, or you know, buy their own top-up insurance at their own cost based on the um, um, risk that they predicted in their own families, right? So wellness as we rolled it out was still very clearly something that we did to control our insurance cost. It was not something that we ran as a preventive uh, care program. So very much in line with that, when we rolled out wellness as well, uh, when I started, uh, when we launched wellness per se, um, I still recall the first structure being a whole bunch of, uh, an array of things in terms of awareness and education programs. That's the first set of things we rolled out. So you had awareness programs on how to be healthy, you had it on pregnancies, you had it on a heart, you had on diabetes, also on financial wellness, a whole bunch of things. Never mind the global statistic that less than 7% of the people who go through any of these programs actually go ahead and put anything into actual action, right? We knew all that, but we still ran out these programs. And the only metric we saw and I have Arvind Krishna who ran all those metrics for us, was participation. We would say we want people sitting at those forums, we want them to listen, and we would push our business partners. We would have um, our, our uh, partners in, uh, people like the Fuller Life, et cetera, running this for us, and we would push people saying, get more people in because we need to see the numbers. Um, but we had no metric that was a double click down to tell us uh, what was still driving our claims ratio. So this must have been around 2010 sort. So from the next year, we changed that, and one of the big examples that I will take to take you through this is really when we changed our corporate health check program. Um, that was a huge lesson in negotiation. I see Pratik, who was fabulously on our side then, where we sat and negotiated multiple um, uh, you know, lab partners to be able to get one lab uh, diagnostic center who would actually run a very, very in-depth uh, uh, program for us, which will do all the health check on site. What we had was uh, giving people uh, a certain amount of money or an allowance which would let them go to negotiated centers, get their health check done, and get the reports back. But we had no access to it at all in any form. So we changed that, we brought it in-house, and we started doing a far, far better program than what uh, a lot of the diagnostic centers would uh, uh, offer them for the same money. Uh, it was also an incredible exercise in logistics. Again, we had uh, Arvind and his team run this for us. And the response was incredible. 
we had far more participation than we saw ever with giving those uh, uh, allowances out. Very importantly, the response that we saw in terms of data, and clearly we never got the data ourselves, we had our partners analyzing it for us, gave us an incredible view about chronic conditions, which was what was you know, holding our charts really high, apart from incidents, of course, right? You had the heart incident, you had cancer that was eating into your uh, premium amounts, everything else. But we had a fabulous view of people who were at high risk already, and people who were moving into the high risk space, which I thought was incredible. Uh, we also were very lucky in terms of being able to detect uh, cases of leukemia even before the employee knew it because we saw anomalies in their uh, blood tests. We detected hepatitis B before the employees knew it. So it was an incredible story and gave us enough of a push to say, let's move it to a year-on-year -year situation. So we ran it for the second year and the patterns that emerged was, again, very, very good. So we ran it for a couple of years and we came up with a, with a whole bunch of communication plans and programs which we would reach out to through the panel of doctors that we were tied up with to speak to the employees that were in high risk. So we had people in high risk, medium risk, and, and the data was being cut and spliced in any which way that we wanted. We had incredible insights. Um, so we started definitive programs that were uh, diabetes specific. We had programs that were hypertension specific, and we had people that we were tying up with, right? We had a poem and other people like that we were tying up with to roll these programs out. And the response was nice. It was good. Uh, there was a lot of curiosity initially. People joined in, etc. And uh, we, we did see a significant, you know, tangible changes were made. And so, in fact, our investment in wellness actually went up by about 30% in the, in the forthcoming year because we had very, very good results that we were seeing. And yet, um, there was a, a, a group of people that we saw year on year who stayed in the high-risk area, right? So we worked with the doctors and our legal team to say that we want to get in touch with them, not personally, but through a third party, and tell them that you really need to look at your health now. Uh, because you've been here for a long enough time and you haven't made the right change. So, you know, our doctors wrote to them and um, so given, given that we were separated by HIPAA, we couldn't get all the details, but we did see some people joining in and some people responded to us. I still remember this one particular lady who responded to us saying that, um, I know I'm overweight, I'm diabetic and I'm hypertensive and I'm fine with it. I've always been like this and my family has always been like this. Um, I'm very happy about it, and I don't intend to do anything about it. Um, you know, I still, you know, that was one of those responses that you look at and say, what are we not doing right? Why are we not able to appeal to a person like this? And about four or five months later, we lost an employee. And we don't know if it was this employee, but all my team and I could sit and do was to look at that health rate chart and say, was this the outlier? Was this the same person who wrote to us? Um, and how are we not able to stop people in their 30s and, you know, sub 45 go into a situation like this? So, you know, it came back with a whole bunch of soul searching again. I clearly remember having a one hour long conversation with Arvind saying, what did we do wrong? How can, I, how can we prevent this from happening? Um, but one of the things we realized very strongly at that point of time is that uh, health is still not a priority in India. It simply isn't. We would put uh, finances, we would put material gains, uh, even other emotional gains ahead of health. That's just simply the truth. That's the first part. The second thing that we, I noticed is that, uh, or rather we learned is that the threat of a risk is no risk at all. You know, you've got to be in the risk zone to make those changes. And even when you do at that point of time, it's perhaps a little too late. Uh, so we had people who knew that they were at high risk of getting diabetes or a heart condition, wouldn't do it till that condition hit them, and then they would live a less than product, fully productive life um, with the burden uh, on your pocket. I mean, India is one of the countries with the highest amount of out-of-pocket expenses, right? We don't have a state uh, 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 participation in this. Um, if you were to look at uh, the effect of obesity in the U.S., it's about 1.4 trillion, if I'm not wrong, uh, by last count on a 20 trillion GDP economy. Um, we're a 2.5 trillion GDP. Uh, and, and we don't have the state sponsoring a lot of our health stuff, right? So this burden is on our pockets and we're willing to live with it, which is what, uh, you know, we were grappling with saying, how do we help people change this? How do we help people understand that this is actually hitting your pocket and it's best taken care of now? Um, it's also around this time that I actually stepped out of the corporates. Uh, you know, mergers and acquisitions have a wonderful way of asking you if this is what you should be doing in life. And I did step out at that point of time. But I stepped out having learned as, the, uh, as someone who led Asia Pacific in Japan in my last role that um, both physical and emotional health in Asia was a very serious concern. 
um, there's a huge amount of options available across the board in all these countries to be able to fix it. Uh, there's certainly a fair amount of uh, interest that's there among the corporate people, but outside of our very small slice of the corporates that we look at, the non-corporate world is not even aware of any of this. Right? This, this push, this very focused thrust that we do on wellness within our organizations is not available if you were to do B2C. Um, the other thing is that we are strongly following the secular trend of all developed nations, right? Um, obesity is becoming an issue or has already become an issue in most developed nations and India is following it perfectly. So um, that I went away. Also along with this particular mail that I got where this girl had said that she was fine being where she was because she was always like this. So I did the next logical thing. Uh, I started sitting with children. Uh, I started looking at numbers of children who were overweight or obese. And uh, I think what I saw kind of jarred me a little. Um, I found out that we have almost 15 million obese and overweight children in India today. Um, this is numbers as of um, a little over a year back. It's possibly changed. Um, both type 2 diabetes, which we always, always attributed to people in their late middle ages to early old age, is something that's already seeped into children. We are actually one of the leading countries with regard to childhood diabetes uh, in the world today. Type 2 is picking up and picking up very, very fast. Um, remember, in type 2, it's, it's a disease that comes halfway through your childhood. You've got to push the person into a brand new set of habits. Uh, the parents have to be pushed into a brand new set of habits in terms of how to manage this. Um, hypertension. We started seeing children uh, who were sub-15 with enlarged arteries and hypertensive uh, cardiac disorders, um, and a whole host of other things. But what I saw last, uh, one of the endocrine fellows, fellow students that uh, I met with uh, and worked with for about three months early this year, showed me enough data to say that um, you know, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which all of us would know earlier on as liver cirrhosis um, and believe that it was always caused by alcoholism, has a non-alcoholic -alco uh, part as well, and that's on the rise in Indian children. Uh, these are not conditions that should just be statistics. These are conditions that will actually uh, cause a terribly unproductive life and eventually death. And that's on the rise, which was a huge surprise with these numbers. And I think that's kind of what made me decide that this is where I will um, put in my effort for whatever time I can and make an impact. Um, I looked at media reports. We're certainly having about you know one or two coming out every quarter for sure. Um, you cannot uh, uh, find fault with the fact that we have far more undernourished children than malnourishment due to obesity in the country, and therefore it's still undernourished children that get uh, more of the uh, uh, attention, and rightfully so. However, there isn't enough light that's being shed on overweight and obese children, and the fact that that is also a form of malnourishment. Um, so my story is long and ongoing, but I will just try and fold this in the next couple of, you know, in a, in a few points. Uh, the first thing that we see typically in, in, in India is that uh, the effects of our being an agrarian culture still stays. We are a feast of famine culture. We eat when the harvest is good, and then we get ready to starve when the harvest is off, excepting there's no off time now, right? Um, there's an abundant supply of food. In certain demographics, there is a fair amount of income that's increasing, and the first thing that we do is put food on the table because we still come from that very clear uh, agrarian background. And to be fair, that's still our biggest industry. Uh, that still remains. Also is the fallout of that, which is that a sight of a thin child is not acceptable to us visually. Right? Everybody who sees a thin child, and I'm sure all of us have had some experience of this or, the, or another, a child may be thin and active and healthy, honestly, but the response is this child is thin and therefore should be either weak or unhealthy because we're still hit by the visuals of what children in our country were maybe a few decades back. And therefore, there is still a push of saying, get your child to be fatter, get your child to be healthier. And you know, there are people who say, they don't even say my child is fat, they say my child is healthy. When, when you turn it around, the child is anything but. Right? So that's the second thing that we saw. The third thing that we see is um, really in terms of uh, defining children right? uh, and people. Um, one of the things we saw is most of the parents would come and say, my child is fat or thin. Um, you know, when I was working with doctors, they never used the words fit or unfit. They never said my child's health is good or bad. They just said my child is weak or not weak. Um, I think the metric that we use, very often most of the parents don't even check the child's BMI because they don't believe it's important till they reach a certain age of, you know, early adulthood, um, which is very dangerous 
because a child has a childhood BMI metric and it's a perfectly accepted global metric, right? Um, the other thing that we saw is um, the guilt that comes with try with in parents with trying to make their child better. Very often, uh, the children that I work with, I have parents who say, listen, don't tell my rest of my family about it. We don't want to tell anybody about it because we are blamed for making our child thinner. And we keep saying, you're not making your child thinner, you're trying to make your child fitter because your child will go on to live an incredibly productive life later on. But that guilt of saying that we're not letting our child live their full by be allowing them to eat what they want is still a very, very significant issue. Um, then um, the third thing that we saw, which is very dangerous, is parents who do have uh, overweight or unhealth, morbidly obese children actually put them on pretty dangerous diets. We've seen parents who've put their children on Herbalife, um, supplements, extremely restricted diets uh, who've gone on to have further complications from there on. Uh, despite the fact that, you know, for adults, uh, restrictive diets have such a low uh, uh, success rate, we still see parents doing that. And it's a very unsustainable thing we've realized because the children simply don't stick to it. Adults don't stick to it. We can't expect a child to stick to it. And it's just very detrimental to their health. So that's another big issue that we see that when we're constantly fighting. Um, finally, a big thing that we realized um, is that with children, I guess as with adults, uh, their state of health is not just a physical thing. It's not about motivation or their inability to curb what they're eating. It's a deeply, deeply psychological thing. Um, I, I, I just have one anecdote to tell you just how vast the gap is. We, we, have a, we had a child who was a preteen and was above 90 kilos. Um, so we asked the mother saying, you know, if you were to join, our, join us, what would you see as a success metric? And she said, I want my child to become smart. So we said, okay, that's a word. Now define smart to us. So she said, I want my child to look good. I want my child to be witty and fun to be with. And this is a preteen, huh? So the child is not yet 13. Um, I want my child to be looked at and by, admired by people in my family and my uh, friend circle. He's got to be a child that is a model child. So we said, okay, that's a bit of a long list, but we'll take that. And then we went to the child separately and we said, what do you want out of all of this? You know, this is going to be a big thing that you're going to be working with us on. What do you want? And the child's ex response verbatim was, I want one friend. And I think one of the things that we don't look at is the effect of being overweight in children. They're constantly teased, they're bullied, they're anxious, usually um, on the borderline between anxiety and depression, and they're certainly very, very lonely. So um, with that in hand, um, what we're doing at Skook is really putting the children through a huge program. It takes about eight to 10 months for us to do it. But what we do is try and work with the child and the parent it's not a single uh, line program. We have the child and the parent. The reason we bring in the parent is the other insight we had is that the correlation between um, childhood obese, uh, the child's obesity and maternal obesity is over 80%. So there's an 80% chance that a mother who's out of shape is going to have a child that's out of shape as well. Um, we have enough data that I've picked up from multiple hospitals that showed a, a, a more than 60% chance that an overweight child would grow up to be an overweight adult. So with all of that, what we do is that we take the children and the parent through a 10-month program where we work with them, sometimes separately, sometimes together, but very, very closely in terms of helping them change how they're doing a lot of things. And that could be across uh, their diet, their medication, um, their physical activity, their emotional health, how they're responding to pressure, um, social or otherwise, uh, the pressure that they feel themselves, um, how the mother is supporting or the parent, whoever the primary caregiver is, um, is supporting the child in situations where the child is not able to, uh, you know, is not, there's, there's, no, there's a huge lack of self-efficacy, for example, right? So that's what we're doing. Uh, it's very, very early, early years. Um, I've been doing this fully for about a year now. Um, and the science is proven. I don't believe there's an issue with the science, right? I heard Goki, et cetera. There is a science to it, and you can fix your chronic disease issues. Um, but I think what I come out of it with is um, how do we make it more uh, normal to do this, right? It's got to be something that we do as a matter of, uh, as, as a matter of habit. It's, a, it's got to be something that we do as a matter of routine. So um, I think one of the big things that we're doing is that through the journey, what we're working on is making sure that for each child, um, health, is a matter of uh, as much passion and intensity that we would put into our child when we teach them religion, for example, right? It's got to be as tightly held as your values. Uh, we want them to do it with the same um, rigor and routine as they would 
when they get up in the morning and brush their teeth um, every day. None of us take that for granted. We don't say, oh, you know what, today I'm going to skip brushing my teeth, for example, this morning. We do it no matter what. And that's what we'd like our kids to do as well. We're, uh, one of the things that we tell them very clearly is that we're not a diet program. So we don't give our children a diet per se, right? We don't say, you don't do this and you don't do that. Um, what we do is we just slowly work with them on changing the way they eat. So they eat what they have to eat. The, they just have to eat, you know, two rotis or a, or a bowl of rice every day. They also need to eat a whole bunch of other things along with it, and that's what we work with them on. So there is, there's no way that we need a cheat day or, a, or something like that. We, you're just getting into a routine which should be held as closely as you do with regard to your health um, or your physical cleanliness, for, for example. And it's not a short-term thing. This is not something you can fix by going to a dance class or a football class. And believe me, that's what we hear parents say, you know, send her to a dance class. Um, so this is a long-term thing, which is going to be there for the rest of your life, and you've got to hold it with that same um, uh, sanctity that you would hold a lot of other things very close to you at. And uh, on the psychological side, that's the other thing that we tell all our children, that uh, and we help them build this, both in the parent and the mother uh, and the child, that they're good and strong enough to do this. And you know, I wish I could have more time with you to share the data, but some of our sub-seven-year-olds will stun you by running three kilometers every day, every single day. The parent won't, but the child will go and run. We're talking about five and a half year olds um, who will do strength exercises um, with not the intensity of an adult, but definitely with the dedication that would put a lot of us to shame. So uh, I wish I could show you that, but these are early years. And uh, I think I'm very convinced that a grassroots level movement is what we need to be able to take care of health uh, the way that it's moving in India. That was it for me. Thank you.